Um, but I'm going to start with the first document, the high level summary. That's the one page um, summary that really goes over the, the main points in this bill because it is for a tax bill, it is quite long. Usually the bills I'm walking you through in your committee are much shorter than this. Um, many of these changes are conforming changes because of the, the breadth of what this bill does. It um, eliminates the property tax credit and the homestead um, tax. So most of the changes that you see towards the end of the bill, it's sort of front loaded at the, the first few pages of the bill. The rest of the bill tends to be conforming changes. So as you've just discussed, the main major um, policy shift and tax policy shift in this bill is creating a new resident education tax. So the tax rate is um, the education spending of the taxpayer's school district divided by the yield. So as um, Deb did point out and Senator Hardy emphasized this as well, this isn't changing the whole structure, it's changing the tax base. Um, so the tax base would be federal adjusted gross in income. So it's AGI of every Vermont resident that, that applies to both homeowners and renters. And that's an important point as we go through um, that renters would be subject to this tax. And in this bill, there is currently no credit that's proposed. There is a new definition of the yield, but it's not dramatically different. Under current statute, there's the yield for um, homeowners who pay based on property value and those who pay the majority who pay based on income. This eliminates those two, has one yield, and it's very similar to the existing yield language. It's just that it's the education tax rate. Um, so the yield is the amount of spending per per equalized pupil that would result if the resident education tax rate was 1% and if the Ed Fund uh, stabilization reserves were maintained at their statutory rate, which is 5% of the prior year's appropriations. Can you share screen? Oh, absolutely. I'm with sorry. us, I think it might be easier if we can all sure. look at it rather than going back and forth here on the agenda. And I apologize. I don't know how I got into a Senate finance through the website that didn't have today's drafts or handouts on it. I went out and came back in somehow and there they are. So there are charts from Deb there. Okay. Yes. Um, so I will share my screen. You will find these if you want to follow along online um, under my name for S212. Let me, um, take, give me just a moment. Great. So everyone should have the sort of high level one page summary now. Oh, just... yeah. um, so I'm... Under the first bullet point, looking at the definition of the yield. Um, so it is very similar to the existing statute. It's the amount that would be raised. Um, in this case, it's the resident education tax rate at 1%. Under current statute for the homestead rate, it's $1. Um, so it's very similar. To note, there was a question about how this would impact different um, taxpayers at different income levels. The bill does provide for a reduction in the tax rate for lower income filers, and it's a uh, progressive reduction. So for um, single filers who have adjusted gross income of $25,000 or less, the maximum reduction would be 85 per, or 80% of the tax rate. And for joint filers with AGI of $50,000 or less, they would get that maximum. And then it phases out for um, amounts of AGI above that. Tax payments are required under the bill either by quarterly wage withholding or through quarterly um, estimated tax payments. And then there would be a, an annual reconciliation when the individual files their income tax return. Um, so that would be at the time of filing the income tax return. And the way that taxpayers would withhold would be based on the prior year's statewide average rate for the education tax and taxpayers would choose um, the rate at which they would withhold from their paycheck um, at 75% of the prior year's rate, 100% uh, or 125%. All of the education um, tax revenues would be deposited into the education fund in the way that property tax revenues are currently. Um, as I mentioned, 
previously, this bill does eliminate both the homestead education property tax and the existing property tax credit. So many of the bill sections that you see are just conforming changes. So it's repealing a lot of references to the property tax credit um, as well as the homestead tax. The non-homestead education property tax is still um, imposed under this proposal in S-212. And I did try and explain part of what you were just discussing about how, it would, how the property tax would apply um, when an individual has a homestead that's greater than two acres. So you would subtract, you'd essentially have an exemption for the homestead and the two acres around that dwelling. And then the, anything above the two acres would be subject to the non-homestead um, property tax. So in that case, you could have an individual, take two different examples, you could have a, a homestead owner who has a property that's 1.75 acres, they would not be paying any property tax on that, they would just be paying the income, the education tax on their income. Um, an individual who has, say, a nine acre property, the first two acres surrounding their um, home, their homestead would be subtracted and the remaining seven acres would be subject to the non-homestead tax. And then that individual would also be paying the resident education tax. Okay. Like it is today. Yeah. The way it is today. Yes, that's not a change. Okay, okay, okay. thank you. Okay, let's keep going. Um, and another important point is that this bill does continue to provide the existing renter credit, which starting um, for filers right now is significantly different. That was um, reformed in 2020. Um, so that has not been changed in any way. And that is one of the, the outstanding questions in this bill is how to um, handle renters. And that brings us to the final major change under this bill, which is creating a new education fund advisory committee. So it'd be an ongoing committee to monitor the entire education funding system that would be required to report and make annual recommendations back to the General Assembly. They would take on the December 1st tax rate letter um, the committee does include the commissioner of taxes and the secretary of education. So they're currently involved with the December 1st letter. It would put them on this committee and the committee would be making the recommendation. The committee um, does have other members in addition to the commissioner of taxes and secretary of education. It has um, expert uh, public members with expertise in education financing. Um, each of the bodies of the general assembly would appoint two of those individuals. And then there would be one public member um, appointed by the governor. The, the committee does need to report, and I'll talk about this in just a moment, but they would need to report in their initial report back to the General Assembly with a few key points of what has not been completely ironed out in this bill. Um, one would obviously be the first recommended um, education tax rates and the yield. Um, the committee would also need to propose uh, a new structure for the renter credit program. Um, and this is to address those renters who um, may be paying both on their income, so be paying the edu resident education tax, and then they may also be paying um, rent that includes the portion of um, the non-homestead property tax um, within their rent that their landlord would be charging them. Um, and many of the renters um, that would have to declare um, and pay the new resident education tax um, would not be eligible for the existing renter credit, um, which I won't go into great detail about all of those changes that are made in 2020, but that is um, based on income and family size. So this especially would, this first report would particularly need to focus on those renters who are, um, would be paying both taxes and not receiving a credit. Uh, lastly, um, one of the areas that the bill did not go into great detail about or make some of the policy decisions about are penalties for um, late filings of the resident declaration, which is the, really the equivalent of the, homes, the current homestead declaration, or if someone does not file. So I will pause there. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Okay. Um, and I don't know if it makes more sense to... Um, look at each individual section of the bill or to go through some of the outstanding questions or to take questions I open to what the committee would like to do. I do have a detailed section by section. Yeah, like I it. think a detailed. Sandra Hardy, do you have a question? Uh, no, I actually have a comment. I just um, wanted to 
let everybody know that the education fund advisory committee portion of this bill was actually also one of the recommendations of the pupil waiting task force that we create that regardless of whether we do the the income tax thing um the 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 pupil the, the the task force felt like it would be helpful overall um to have this body overseeing and doing work in the interim on education finance issues the weights the taxes the okay. categorical aids whatever it is so and that work is not being done now uh not regularly um there's there is a process for doing the december one memo but that's mm -hmm. kind of all there is and so this would expand that to have more oh, have more attention paid by people who understand the system into updating parts of the system, whether, like I said, whether it's the weights, whether it's the rates, whether it's the, the, the penalties, whatever it is. Um, so that was part of the task force recommendations as well. Okay. So committee, where would you like to go next? Or is this so new. Um, any time, Senator Pearson. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm curious. Uh, Ms. Brighton said that JFO was. I, I don't know where to direct or ask Abby to go. I, I, um, but uh, so I have a sort of separate question, which is JFO schedule. Do we have a sense um, of when? they're able to help us get those runs because I agree with you, Madam Chair, that's sort of certain to put meat on whether or not this yeah. can advance or, or our, our speed and all that. Okay. And I don't know. I think we all know we lost Mark and Mark staffed most of the waiting study and was our 20 year, well, he staffed, I understood a lot of the property tax stuff that he, he was staffed it until he left and yeah, so until he, he left. did about half of it and then he left and so we've lost our long memory uh there and we are i see julia we we are we've got new folks that there's julia you popped over to the other side uh new folks that are working their way through this but uh, Deb, we know Deb hasn't had someone from JFO able to sit down and just kind of proof out the runs. Um, and so what I can do is perhaps, Julia, you can ask Catherine to let us know what kind of a time frame you think they can get that done in. Um, yeah, I'm happy to do that. I'll reach out to Catherine and, and have some offline discussions with Deb and, and our little Ed Finance team as we're all trying to get up to speed right. on this big proposal and get back to the committee. And, and our lead on the Ed Finance is home doing childcare so his wife can recover from COVID. Um, but he is working during naps and in the evening. So maybe he can take a look at the... Um, at the runs during those times. He's just, at least for this week, we're hoping next week, everything's back to normal. Uh, maybe he can, this is something he can do in his spare time. Uh, as all parents of young children know, they have tons of. Uh, so do you wanna have Abby just walk us through a section by section? And then we've got, um, the last thing on the agenda is that uh, overpayment of property tax. Um, the Barry bill that uh, Abby has done, Abby, right? Yes, has done a new drafting, taking in all the feedback from the auditor and um, and that is the last thing on our agenda, but that would put us a whole half hour ahead. I don't know that I can do that. 
Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm looking at faces and I don't see anyone on Friday afternoon that that's really ready to delve into this on a, an in-depth, you know, word for word basis. This isn't new system. We've all been grappling with understanding the old system. Now we're grappling with this one. And the first question for me is, is this a simpler, fairer system? And I think Deb has given us some charts. We can look at those. We can see how quickly we can get the runs in um, because that for me is where I see, you know, well, all right, we've got these, you know, credits that are going to go to people in this income bracket. I need to see how that works out. And then I think we need to give people time to look at it. I think we need to, once we have everything, uh, make sure that the tax department get you know comes in and talks to us and we're dealing with property tax so we're going to have to hear from the town clerks um and see how because at one point they were really thrilled of the state take over the collection and then they figured out what it was going to cost them and they weren't as thrilled as having the state so um cost them you know, meaning pardon when you say what was going to cost them? They, they get paid for processing the state education. They get so much per parcel. All right. I knew. Um, the teacher is watching. And um, that, that, that would have to work out, too. But I think we'd need to hear from them. The collections? Who would, who would earn the money from collecting delinquent taxes? That's the other question we're going to want to hear from the clerks on, uh, because this would essentially put the homestead property tax collection into the tax department, and it would be paid on an installment or annually, I guess. Uh, it could be done on an income deduction, but that would take something from your employer. So there's some things to be worked out there. I personally have always said the reason we get so many complaints about the property tax and not about income or your credit card payments, if you ever add up the interest that gets paid on credit cards, is because you pay them off in monthly installments. If you ever had to pay your credit card or your credit card interest payments off once a year, you'd probably scream. And, you know, the same with your income tax. And so anything we can do to kind of spread that tax out will make it easier no matter what, you know, what basis we we, we charge it on. If you can make it more more than I think the most is four times a year. We Montpelier does it in quarters, but some towns still do it annually. Um, other towns do it twice a year and some of them give you a credit if you pay it all at once. Um, you know, a, a discount if you pay it, at least they used to, I don't, they may not anymore, but uh, we are messing in the town clerk's territory, and I do that judiciously. Senator Hardy. Yeah, I was just wondering, Abby, you have sort of three things that the, th the overview you just went over, then the bill itself, which is obviously the most detailed, and then a, an interim one. Do you think it would be helpful to go through that interim one or that's, is that just that's what we're talking different? about yeah. because he's like i can do this section by section rather than look i mean it's a 46 page bill um so and the sec i do go through every section and summarize what it's doing um so i think this section by section would probably be the uh, most okay efficient. why don't we do that and then we've been okay. through it um 
if we can do that in, you know, again, fairly quickly, because I think we're, we're going to need more information and time to process it before we start getting into wordsmithing and tweaking. Yes. Okay. Okay. I will share my screen then in just a moment. Okay. Um, I can't see you, so I hope you can see my screen. Um, well, we can see your screen. Is, and again, excellent. I can't see anybody either. So holler if you have a question. Okay, so this is the section by section for the bill as introduced. Um, and the first section is really a, just a technical change. It's to eliminate the word property from the title of the chapter um, so that it says education taxes instead of education property tax because it inserts this new resident education tax into that chapter. Um, it, I've kept the bill as chronological in terms of the statutes as, as much as possible, but there are some subdivision headings um, with the, you know, the asterisk so that you can situate your, your, yourselves in the bill. Um, I start with education taxes and then I move into um, the Ed Fund Advisory Committee, education fund, renter, credit, and then the end of the bill is a, a series of repeals. Um, so in the very first um, real substantive section, it's section two. Um, this is the section of statute that has all of the property tax definitions in it. Um, it makes one change that then creates a whole bunch of other changes throughout the bill, which is to strike the reference to tax for the equalized property grand list. Um, it re just removes the word tax because um, it will no longer just be the property tax grand list. It will have both homestead and non-homestead properties in it. So that is one, when you're talking about municipal um, municipal responsibilities, they will still be appraising, listing, um, all properties and creating the grand list, um, both for homestead and non-homestead. So this does not change that um, process. Um, it, this also importantly changes the definition of homestead and you had the perfect setup for this change, your discussion earlier about current use versus um, property tax and the property tax credit. The homestead de definition as it is currently for um, determining a homestead property does not make any reference to the two acres. That two acre piece is for the property tax credit. So what the bill does is it repeals the property tax credit defini definition and puts it into the overarching um, definitions relating to homestead. So it would make a homestead, the dwelling and the two acres surrounding each dwelling. And it also pulls in some other language um, from the property tax credit, um, which is being repealed from that uh, chapter and putting it in here about the treatment of cooperatives and mobile home park cooperatives. Um, the definitions for education spending adjustment, dollar equivalent yield and income dollar equivalent yield, so that's the property and the income yields are, are all repealed. Um, and that's because there's no longer um, the property tax credit, it's now the resident education tax rate calculation. As I mentioned before, there is a new yield definition and this is um, language that was in the uh, summary that we went over earlier, the yield means the amount of spending per equalized pupil that would result if this new resident education tax rate was 1% and if the Ed Fund reserves were maintained at their statutory amount, which is 5%. So that's in the definition section. There are a few other changes if you're looking at the language. Again, there are more conforming changes to remove references to homestead um, property tax or to um, the property tax credit. And then again, a lot of changes when it's talking about the grand list, anytime there was mention of property tax grand list, the word tax is being repealed. In section 5402, this is the rate section. Um, so one clarifying change that was made in here is to the non-homestead tax rate. Um, and that is just clarifying that the rate is $100 per equalized education property value. Um, and also that that's unless otherwise set by the General Assembly that's no change to current law. It's just putting it all into the same section. This uh, rate section has the important repeal of the homestead tax rate. It adds in language um, that's under, that's, or sorry, it, it repeals language relating to in, interim homestead tax rates 
for school districts when they haven't voted their budgets by June 30th. And then it adds that language into the new res residential education rate. Um, also repealed is the current requirement for the commissioner of taxes to determine a homestead tax rate um, for union or unified union school districts. The language again is added into the new resident education tax rate section. Um, this, some of this language might need a little bit of tweaking. Some of the technical parts of this don't all line up mathematically, but I won't go into that much detail here. Um, there is one uh, fee that's repealed. I mentioned that this bill doesn't uh, really address a lot of the penalties and fees. However, this one fee that currently goes to towns to cover the cost of issuing a new property tax bill is repealed because that particular fee was for late property tax credit claims. Um, so that's, that's something that would need to be addressed by the um, new Ed Fund Advisory Committee is what, what are the penalties, um, what are the appropriate penalties to charge for late or non-filed non -filed, uh, declarations? Um, where I think a lot of questions are going to come up and where there's probably still work to be done um, in ironing out a lot of your questions and, and a lot of the details for this new tax, um, a lot of those questions can really focus on this section four. That's the section that creates this new resident education tax. Um, and this is the language that I just walked you through in the high level summary, but just a few main points. Again, the tax rate is... Um, it's still influenced, it's still determined by the education spending of the taxpayer school district. It's divided by the yield. Then that rate is applied to federal adjusted gross income. So it's each Vermont resident, both homeowners and renters. One thought, um, one sort of legal perspective, um, one additional change that you might wish to make is to, uh, just based on your discussions now, is potentially moving the tax base to taxable income instead of federal adjusted gross income. That's, that's a pretty um, big policy decision. Um, this, uh, using federal adjusted gross income is not going to pull in any standard deductions, personal exemptions, um, any of, any of those um, adjustments that happen for um, Vermont taxpayers' income tax liability. So that's, that's just one policy thing to keep in mind. Um, as I mentioned, creates a new yield. There is a reduction that phases out, um, but for lower income earners, the tax rate is allowed to be reduced up to 80% for individuals who have $25,000 or less if they're single filers or $50,000 of AGI or less. Um, again, as we mentioned, the structure for receiving the payments, um, an individual can either have withholding from their wages, or if they are self-employed, for example, they would pay estimated tax payments, how, like how they do for income tax. Um, and then this will be followed up by a, an annual filing at the same time as filing the income tax return. Uh, withholding would be at a elective rate. So the taxpayer, like how um, with the W-4, an individual just tells their employer how much to withhold. Um, this bill does require employers to withhold it at an amount that the taxpayer chooses. So it's either 75, 100% or 125% of the prior year's statewide average tax rate. Again, all of these tax revenues go into the education fund. And then here, as I was mentioning in the previous section, um, a couple of technical, um, or not technical C's are important for school districts that haven't voted their budgets by June 30th. There's some, some language in there about how to set that tax rate. And as well, there's language about setting a tax rate for um, taxpayers who are, or towns who are part of more than one uh, school district. Um, I'm going to just keep going in interest of time, but if there are any questions, please do interrupt me. I just can't see anyone. So I'm just going by what I hear. Um, in section six, again, we have some conforming changes. It's repealing references to the tax grant list, um, property tax grant list. It's now just the property uh, grant list. This clarifies as part of the discussion that was had earlier that if a homestead is on a parcel of two acres or less, the entire parcel will be homestead property, so it will not be subject to the non-homestead property tax, but for the portion of um, a property that is over two acres, the non-homestead property tax only applies to that amount over two acres. Um, these, the next two sections are, again, repealing references to um, tax when referring to the grand list. Um, there is an important change here. It just clarifies in 
in Section 5404A of Title 32, that's Section 7 of the bill, municipalities that have a TIF district will be collecting property taxes on non-homestead properties only. Um, section 8, again, repeals references to tax when referring to the grand list. Um, and then there are some uh, clarifications that may need some more work about um, the types of values that the Commissioner of Taxes has to report to towns. Um, as well as um, what has to be provided on property tax bills. There was language put in a few years ago requiring an explanation of um, the homestead tax rate. This changes it so that it, the commissioner would need to provide language to towns for the new resident ed education tax. Section nine of the bill um, adds the common level of appraisal to the list of values that the director of PBR has to report to the town clerks um, and to the secretary of education by certain um, dates each year. So these are some existing reports that um, just add other, other values that need to, reported, to be reported. In section 10, the duties of municipalities are amended slightly. Um, it clarifies again that the, the collection of the property tax is only for non-homestead tax. Um, it also repeals a section relating to the homestead property tax overpayment offset, um, where if an individual is overpaid, that that can um, be used against an income tax liability. That language is added into the resident education tax sections. So it's just shifting. It's a lot of, uh, as I said, conforming changes. So shifting a lot of provisions that currently exist to homestead property tax to this new resident education tax. Um, section 5410 um, in section 11 of the bill, it keeps the existing language around the homestead declaration, but renames it um, and applies it to the resident education tax. So it will now be called the resident declaration of domicile. What is a definite change in policy is that rather than just homestead owners declaring domicile, um, all Vermont residents, so that includes renters, will be required to declare domicile um, for purposes of the education taxes. It does remove um, reference to the homestead tax for late filing penalties. Um, and it clarifies um, what happens if an individual fails to declare the domicile, does not provide for a new penalty, but it, which is something that the Education Fund Advisory Committee may need to consider. Um, it does require the Commissioner of Taxes to determine the individual's tax liability under the resident education tax and bill that taxpayer. The Education Fund Advisory Committee, so I'm, I'm just going to pause because that's all of, that's the bulk of the, uh, the new tax and the new structure. The next few sections are about the committee. Okay. Any questions at this point? Okay, keep going. Okay. It's going to take a while before we have a grasp enough to ask questions. Sure, and I'm trying to just we point out that get, the, we can probably grasp an advisory committee. Yes, yeah, so this is this is a little uh, simpler and really um, creating a new kind of oversight, but more of a monitoring um, function after the tax structure commission's work. Um, this would sort of continue that examining of the from the big picture, but also really in the, in the weeds about um, both overall recommendations annually, but also what the tax rate should be set at. So it, it shifts the Commissioner of Taxes December 1st letter responsibilities to this committee instead of just the, the Department of Taxes. Granted, under, under current statute, the Commissioner is required to um, consult with uh, the Secretary of Administration and JFO, but this shifts it to um, the Ed Fund Advisory Committee. Also, as I mentioned, the committee is required to report um, in this language, it's on or before January 15th of next year um, to the money committees, education committees, um, ways and means in education and Senate finance and education in the Senate. Um, it would be a recommendation for the first tax rates and the yield under the resident education tax. Um, any recommendation is to restructure the existing renter credit program and then of course penalties and then any other recommendations um, that the committee thinks are important to make. Um, the next few sections are a lot of cleanup in the uh, what's currently the Homestead Property Tax Credit and Renter Credit Chapter 151 of Title 32. Um, a lot of the changes are repealing reference to the property 
tax credit. Um, one important note here is in section 16 of the bill, this did come up in your discussion today, I believe Senator Pearson, you mentioned what would happen if there were a transfer. Um, because the new resident education tax follows the income, that's the base, um, it would in theory follow the, the seller. Um, but I mean, both individuals, if they were already Vermont residents would be paying this. There is sort of an outstanding question of what the rate, what the appropriate rate would be um, if the individual is either moving out of the state or moving to a different town with a different school district and a different tax rate. So that that's um, a level of detail that the bill doesn't go into. It doesn't really address that currently. Um, so most of these sections are just removing any reference to the property tax credit and any language um, stating that a certain section only applies to the renter credit. So it's really, this just becomes the renter credit chapter. Um, the next section, starting with section 22 of the bill relate to the education fund. Um, so again, it's repealing references to the homestead tax rate, um, replacing that with resident education tax rate, removing references um, to tax from the equalized grant list. Um, another important point is that it clarifies that the stabilization reserve, um, which is the reserve that's 5% um, of the prior year's appropriations from the Ed Fund, um, any that the Education Fund Advisory Committee will be reviewing that reserve annually. So it's giving them another sort of oversight role in the Ed Fund um, system. I'm skipping over some sections here. Um, section, because again, they're, they're conforming changes, but in section 26 of the bill, um, there was a, a policy decision made there um, for the tax treatment of unorganized towns and boars. Um, and it applies a 2% resident education tax rate um, to, those, to those towns. And it repeals any references to property tax credit. Okay. That is the bulk of the policy changes. The next few sections I have I've listed out everything that's been repealed. Um, just in case there's any confusion there, there, there are veterans exemptions that are repealed because those are only apply to homesteads. So those were taken out because homesteads will no longer be subject to property tax. So there are a lot of repeals that are being made there. And then sections 28 to 32 of the bill are other uh, cross references throughout title 32 to the either the homestead declaration or the homestead tax or the property tax credit. Important um, dates in section 33 of the bill is that only really this effective date section and the Ed Fund Advisory Committee take effect on passage. All of the structural changes take effect um, in one year. So it would be July 1st, 2023, with the understanding that the Ed Fund Advisory Committee would be coming back with recommendations um, next session and that that would give the legislature time to make any changes before the property tax structure took effect July 1st, 2023. And that is the That's end of the uh, section by section. Okay. Any questions at this point? Okay, if not, I'm going to suggest we take a five minute break. Um, before we come back, will Abby rest her voice and get a glass of water or something? And uh, we'll see if we can't do that uh, property tax overpayment bill and then be on our way. <laughs> 